and all, all free papers uh, will be also invited for publication at the Journal of uh, Cryptology. So the, the first paper, which got the, the best paper award, is Tightly CCA Secure Encryption Without Pairings by Romain Gay, Denis Hopfines, Ike Kiltz, and Hotex V, and Romain will give the presentation. Thank you for the introduction. First, uh, I will recall the definition of CCA security. Uh, suppose Alice wants to send the message to Bob through an insecure channel, and suppose that Alice and Bob do not share any secret key, so they use public key encryption, where Bob generates a secret key and a, a, that he keeps for himself and a, a public key that he gives to everyone, thanks to which Alice can encrypt the message. And the basic security notion that we want is if, that if an adversary is dropped on a ciphertext, it should not learn any information about the plain text. Um, formally, this is captured by chosen plain text attack security game, where the adversary gets a public key, then chooses a pair of message M0, M1, and gets back the encryption of one of these two messages picked at random. And finally, the adversary has to guess which message, which message was encrypted. So if the ciphertext doesn't reveal anything about the plain text, in particular, it doesn't reveal uh, any information about the bit B, and the adversary, the adversary has a small advantage of winning this game. So this is for if dropping attack, passive attacks. If you want to capture also active attacks, such as the Blechenbacher attack on TLS, um, we also had a decryption oracle that the adversary can query before and after the challenge ciphertext adaptively and many times. Mm, the only thing the um, adversary cannot do is ask the decryption of the challenge ciphertext. Um, so uh, we, we usually only consider one challenge ciphertext, and this is without loss of generality, because it implies many challenge ciphertexts uh, via hybrid argument. But for the purpose of this talk, I want to make explicit the fact that the adversary can actually get many challenge ciphertexts. So he can send many pairs M0, M1, and get back the encryption, uh, the corresponding encryption uh, of MB. And in fact, I'm going to count the number of challenge, such challenge ciphertexts and uh, decryption oracle queries. So this is a this is a de facto uh, CCA is a de facto security um, notion for encryption. Um, now, how do we prove a scheme is CCA secure? Uh, we do a reduction. So suppose we have an adversary that can win the security game with an advantage epsilon. Then we use it to build an algorithm, uh, an efficient algorithm that has uh, roughly the same running time as the adversary and that can break a uh, hard problem such as ZDH with a smaller advantage. And the ratio between these two advantages is called the security loss. And most schemes use a hybrid argument to get security for many challenge ciphertexts, and therefore, the security loss is proportional to the number of challenge ciphertexts here. This is what we call a non-tight security reduction. And this can be a problem if you want to use the reduction as a tool to choose concrete parameters for your scheme, because then you will have to uh, take into account this loss. For example, if you want uh, 128 bit of security, and that your loss, mm, because of this hybrid argument, uh, is exactly the number of ciphertext, challenge ciphertext, which can be as large at, as 2 to the 30 in a large, widely deployed system, then you will have to pick a group uh, where DDH is unbreakable with uh, advantage more than 2 to the minus 158. So a large loss implies uh, large parameters and less efficiency. To avoid that, we would like to build reductions uh, with a tight uh, security, which means that the security loss L is small. Um, and by small, I mean, in particular, it's ind independent of the number of challenge ciphertext, and uh, it's typically a small constant times uh, the security parameter lambda. Think of lambda as 128, which is much smaller than the number of challenge ciphertext. So finding tight re uh, security reduction um, uh, in the context of encryption and uh, signatures has been extensively studied before. Mm. So now let's look at a prior CCA encryption scheme. Uh, first, we have uh, very efficient schemes, starting with Kromer and Schub, 
encryption scheme where the ciphertext overhead is three group elements. Um, improved by Kurosawa Desmet, uh, two toot group elements. They are based on DDH, which is good. But because they use this hybrid argument to get security for many challenge ciphertext, the security loss um, is large. It's non-tight. Then there is a series of tight construction, starting with Ophine's Jagger, uh, Crypto 2012. Um, but as you can see, looking at this column, these schemes have larger ciphertext overhead. The number of group elements is larger. Even though in the latest uh, work last year, the efficiency has been significantly improved. But more importantly, all these constructions use a qualitatively stronger assumption. They use pairings, which is not the case of non-tight schemes. So a natural question to ask is, um, does tightness intrinsically require the pairing? And the answer is no. Uh, we build a efficient CCA secure encryption scheme, which tightly reduce to DDH, no pairing. So this is a quantitative improvement upon prior tight construction because uh, the ciphertext overhead of our scheme is shorter. It's three group elements, which is um, one group element more than the most efficient CCA secure encryption scheme, which is Kurosawa Desmet. But it's also a qualitative improvement because we use a weaker assumption. We use ZDH. Um, so prior tight construction, uh, higher, um, they use uh, two different techniques. There is a group of, paper, uh, of, of constructions that use signatures and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, uh, which are primitives that admit public verification, and for which we don't know any efficient construction without pairing. So we cannot use this technique. Then there is a group of works that build identity-based encryption, or IBE for short, that is stronger than CCA encryption. And uh, to build them, they use a methodology which is called dual system encryption, introduced by Waters, which require um, computational assumption both on the ciphertext and the secret key space. And therefore, it also crucially need a pairing. It's inherent to the construction. So we also, we cannot use this technique. Uh, instead, what to, to, to overcome uh, these barriers, uh, we consider the uh, designated verifier NISIC setting, uh, which is like an ISIC, except uh, the verification is, is not public. It requires a secret key, as in command shoop. Uh, I won't formally define what a DBNISIC is. Instead, I'm going to describe the technique in the context of command shoop encryption. So this is our starting point. Also, we encounter uh, new techniques that I'll talk to later, new technical difficulties. So this is uh, our result. Now, the overview of the construction, uh, we build, to build a CCA secure encryption scheme, we build a much simpler primitive, which is called a tag-based encryption. Uh, I'll define more in more details what it is later. But this tag-based encryption uh, is simpler than the CCA in two ways. First, using tags simplifies the proof. And these tags are uh, easy to instantiate using standard technique, such as one-time signature. In our case, we use collision-resistant hash function for efficiency. And the second thing is that this tag-based encryption scheme is not actually CCA secure. It satisfies the weaker notion of security. Uh, for those who know, it's called uh, plain text checkable attack security. And this is easier to prove, again. So this makes uh, this thing simpler to, to design. Uh, and again, using standard framework, uh, we, you can uh, upgrade this weaker than TCA primitive to full CCA security using authenticated symmetric encryption. So roughly, we instantiate a standard framework with a new tag-based encryption. So this is our co uh, contribution, build this tag-based encryption. Um, we also do non-trivial optimization when we combine these three pieces together, but I'm not going to talk about this uh, in this talk. I'm only going to focus on the tag-based encryption uh, because it's a core component and it captures most technical novelties. So what is the tag-based encryption? It's mm, encryption where the encryption algorithm takes an additional input tau here, which is called the tag, and the decryption also takes an additional input tau and it decrypts a ciphertext for tau star when tau is equal to tau star. Okay. 
So this is correctness for stack-based encryption. Now the security is similar to the previous CCA security for tax-free encryption. The difference is that now we require that the adversary queries a decryption oracle with a tag tau that must be different from the tag tau star used in the challenge ciphertext. Okay, here. As I said, we can enforce this using, for instance, collision resistant hash function. And the proof, security proof, crucially rely on this property here. So um, I will give the construction in three steps. First, uh, our starting point is a simple CPA secure encryption scheme uh, known as Damgard El Gamal. Um, then I'll show how to uh, modify it slightly to get a simplified version of Prom and Shoop encryption scheme, which is non tight. And finally, I will show how to uh, modify it again to get our construction, which is tight. So this will be the outline of the rest of the talk. So, first, this simple um, Damgard El Gamal encryption. Uh, we use a prime order group, uh, and the secret key is simply a random vector of exponent of dimension two, k, here. Um, so through all this talk, I'm going to use white boxes to denote vectors of, group, uh, of exponent over zp, and blue, blue boxes and later red boxes to denote vectors of group elements. This will be the convention. So secret key is a vector of exponent of dimension two, and the public key contains a random vector of group elements of dimension two. And the inner product of this vector k with the vector a, uh, when, uh, where the inner product is done in the exponent, just like so. So this is a group element, okay? This is the public key. Um, and the ciphertext, to, compute, to encrypt a message, uh, one picks a random exponent r and compute these a times r here, and the corresponding uh, k times a r, which serves as an encapsulation key for the message m, which is a group element. Okay. Uh, to decrypt, one uses the secret key here, k, to, uh, which we multiply with this part of the uh, ciphertext to get the encryption, the encapsulation key, and get back the message. Okay, so it's very simple. Correctness. And for security, we will need two properties. The first property says that um, this vector a times r is computationally indistinguishable from a uniformly random vector of group elements, u, here. And this is true even uh, when the vector a is given. Okay, and this is implied by DDH. So we can switch this a times r to a uh, uniformly random vector here and here. Um, this is the first property. Second property tells that, says that, that this value k times a, this group element, is random, independent of this group element k times u, statistically independent. This is because uh, a and u are independent uh, random vector, so they, most of the time they will be linearly independent, and therefore these values are also independent. So finally, we can argue that this value here is a uniformly random gr group element that completely masks the message M. So this concludes the proof. So this is uh, our starting point. It's a simple encryption, but it's not CCA secure, in particular because it's multiplicatively homomorphic. But we can modify it slightly to get a simplified version of Chrome and Shoop encryption scheme, uh, just like so. So instead of using secret key k, we'll use two random vectors, k0 and k1. And we want to build a tag-based encryption uh, where tags are in zp, and uh, they are mapped to a vector k tau defined by k0 plus tau times k1. This is what Chrome and Shub did. And this map um, is a pairwise independent hash function which means a k tau is independent of k tau star when tau is different from tau star. And the security proof crucially relies on this property. I shall later. Okay, so 
this is what we obtain when we replace k by k0 and k1. So this is a simplified version uh, of Kraman Shoop, as I said, which is actually not CCA secure. I'm a bit simplifying here. Okay, so this is our, the, uh, no, not our, it's Kraman Shoop encryption. And uh, to compute a ciphertext for tau, you compute this um, encapsulation key, okay, as I described. Um, now let me show you where the pairwise independence property comes up in the proof in a simplified setting where the adversary only gets one challenge ciphertext for tau star and one decryption oracle query for tau, which must, must be different from tau star mm, by definition of the security gain. Okay, so this is a simplified setting. Now, by pairwise independence, we can argue that this tau, uh, k tau, is independent from k tau star because tau is different from tau star. And therefore, the decryption oracle query doesn't leak any information, in fact, about this encapsulation key. So we can just ignore it and do the same proof as for the CPA secure encryption scheme. Okay, so that's the idea. And finally, to get many challenge ciphertext for many different tag tau, as is the case in, in the security proof. So this is the adversary view. And many decryption oracle queries for many different tau also. We do a um, Kremlin Shoop uh, uh, did a hybrid argument. And if you do it in a clever way, you can prove that the advantage uh, of the adversary breaking the scheme is m less than uh, this quantity here, which corresponds to the computational argument, which we use once per challenge ciphertext, plus this quantity here, which, is, which, which corresponds to the statistical argument, which is used once per challenge ciphertext decryption query pair. So because of this hybrid argument, this is not tight. Okay, a security loss is proportional to the number of challenge ciphertext. Um, so our idea was to mm, avoid this hybrid argument by using a uh, stronger properties than the pairwise independence, because the pairwise independence forces you to enumerate over all the possible uh, challenge ciphertext and decryption query pairs. To avoid this hybrid argument, we use a stronger property that can talk about all the challenge ciphertexts at the same time. So instead of pairwise, we would like number of ciphertext wise, basically. Again, to avoid uh, this hybrid argument and get tight proof. So we would like to design this k-tau, which behaves as a number of ciphertext wise, but the number of ciphertext is unbounded. So number of ciphertext wise is actually a random function on tau. But we cannot set k tau to be a random function because that would be too large. So that the key and the secret key would be too large. So what we do is use a k tau that behaves as a random function computationally in the cy ciphertext space. So it's sort of a randomized PRF, if you want. Uh, basically, it means that in all ciphertext, you can argue that this k tau times this AR is computationally indistinguishable from a random function on tau. And this PRF, randomized PRF, uh, has to be tight. So this is what we want to build. Now let's see how we implement this ID. Uh, we do so by modifying the simplified version of Kramer and Shoop encryption scheme uh, by replacing K0 and K1 with a set of two lambda vectors, KIB, for index, uh, for, for I from one to lambda and B a bit zero or one. Okay, so the secret key is going to be huge in our setting. And we map the pairwise independent hash function to, we replace it uh, with um, a map that takes tags which are now lambda bit strings and maps them to the, uh, the vector uh, here, a, a sum of lambda vector. So this is used in the Chenwe uh, identity-based encryption, a tightly secure uh, identity-based encryption. And it's also reminiscent from narrow angle PRF, also quite different. So this is our, our ID. And finally, for technical reason, we also have to increase the size of all the, um, the, the vectors. So instead of having dimension two vectors, we'll increase the size at, and have dimension three vectors. This is a bit technical. So finally, this is a constriction we get. So as I said, the uh, secret key and public keys are, are large. Uh, and the proof sketch, uh, I already give the intuition 
uh, we, we basically, so if this is the adversary view with many chain ciphertext and many decryption queries, uh, we have to prove simultaneously in all the chain ciphertext that this part here behaves as a random function, as I said, using this uh, randomized PRF uh, paradigm. And the main technical challenge is to carry on the chain we proof in a pairing free setting. Because chain and we use dual system encryption, which use pairing. In our case, we replace a computational argument by a statistical argument in the secret key space to get rid of the pairing. That is the main uh, technical difficulty we solve. And finally, we get, in, we show that the adversary cannot break the scheme with advantage more than this quantity here. So you, you see that the security reduction is much smaller. Okay. Uh, to sum up, we build an efficient scheme that tightly reduces to DDH. And the only uh, drawback of our scheme is the very large public key, which is also the case for most tight construction, but which is not the case for uh, non-tight construction. So a natural open problem would be, can we reduce the size of this public key um, to a constant number of group elements? Some partial progress has been made by uh, Denis Alphines, who built a tightly secure signature with constant size uh, verification key, but it uh, crucially relies on pairing. And uh, more broadly, uh, can we build a tightly secure uh, CPA uh, encryption from minimal assumption or ha such as uh, RDES of, of factoring or uh, CDH. Um, so this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? small inoptimality in your scheme is that uh, you increase the number of group elements from two to three, but I assume that uh, it was in the, uh, one of the last few slides where the vector size uh, increased from uh, two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Yes. And then you said that uh, you have to do it for technical reason. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Why is it necessary to increase from two? What's wrong with two? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so we need to increase the size from dimension two to dimension three. And uh, so the reason is in, uh, in the proof. Um, if we use a chain we IBE proof, uh, uh, we'll, we require, uh, there is a um, um, condition that must be satisfied, which says that, so there will be many hybrids, and uh, at one hybrid, at uh, one given hybrid, uh, all the tag in the challenge ciphertext should have the same value for the, the, okay, the highest bit of the tag should have the same value. It should be all zero or one, which is not uh, realistic. So to, <coughs> to get around this um, uh, condition, we need basically to give two copies of the scheme, more or less. One which will be used for the bit zero, and one which will be used for the bit one. Okay. In fact, this is, um, right, this is, uh, we have this uh, technique which is also used in this, pa in this paper, which we have to adapt. And so these two copies means you have to increase the size of the vector A. Um, basically, one dimension. So you have three dimensions. One dimension is for correctness, and uh, the two other dimensions are for the proof. Instead of one extra dimension, you need two, basically. Thank you. Any other question? So I guess in practice, if you have like a non-tight scheme like Kramer Shoop or like Kurosawa Desmond, I guess you have this, you know, factor Q, uh, right loss. So Q is like, I don't know, what is it in practice? Maybe like two to the 30, two to the 40. Mm -hmm. But then you're saying, so that translates to like a bigger group. But yes. in your case, even ignoring the secret key, the ciphertext are now like three elements versus two. So did you make any like realistic mm. parameter computation? Do you actually, yeah. even ignoring the secret key and public key inefficiency, do you actually say for you usually lose? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So uh, 
tightness becomes more important than saving one group element. Uh, when uh, the, for, say, uh, 128 bit of security, uh, we computed it, and it's uh, when the number of challenge self attacks is larger than 2 to the 74. So it's quite a large number of self attacks. For lambda equal 128, using elliptic curves, this is when you take into account the security loss. So, yeah. Okay, any other question? No questions, so let's thank the speaker again.